Incredible Artists once again for you, streaming live from their homes. And I'm so excited to be able to introduce these folks because there's so many great talents out there and we're just starting to attract them. Uh, just, you know, people are emailing me and uh, getting my phone number, texting me. So it's pretty exciting. And keep those folks coming because we just want to stream into your lives something that is of beauty and culture and art and just up, uplift your spirits. And uh, it actually ups, uplifts mine every week, something to look forward to. But before we get started, I thought it would be really nice to um, just do a little, I have a little test for you guys here to see how well you're doing during this lockdown and this coronavirus. So if you, if any of these things resonate with you, you're doing things right. So let me get my list here and uh, let's see. So number one, if you have started looking at your toilet paper, instead of looking at it as, as a roll, you're looking at each individual slice and contemplating that, you're doing this thing right. Two, if you are thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner while you're eating lunch, you're doing this right. If prior to wearing masks to the grocery store, when you pass somebody in line and you held your breath, again, another point, you're doing this right. This is a really good one. If you've been asking your family members to feel your forehead, asking them, do I feel warm? Again, you're doing this right. If you're binge watching on Netflix, another point. If you're considering every night a weekend night, again, you're, you're right on track. If you're cleaning out every closet that you have and order it, or organizing everything so that you feel one sense of control, you're, you're doing this thing right. If you're wearing your PJs all day long, again, one more point. If you are excited or not excited to go back to work, you're doing this right. And the last one is if you're looking forward to this show, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1 p.m. to watch Art of the City live streaming because there's nothing much else going on, you're doing this right. So that's my countdown for the day. And we are bringing in an amazing woman and her name is Tammy Wong. She's a sommelier, and I have to write that out so I pronounce it correctly. And what that is, is that is a very highly skilled wine taster, someone who has gone through an immense amount of schooling to become a master sommelier. She's right here in San Diego. She is a wine judge. She also serves on the California Grape Panel and is an original member of the San Diego Woman Wine Alliance, which I think I would actually like to be part of because I love wine. I'm not an expert, but I am a woman, so I'm gonna have to talk to her. So I'm gonna see if we can bring her on and she's gonna give us a little class on what she knows best and that is wine. All right. Okay, let's see if Tammy can, there you are, Tammy. Um, hi. Hi. So, so happy to have you. And what a gorgeous backyard you have there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting. So where are you streaming from? What part of San Diego are you in? So I am in my backyard in South Park. All right. Beautiful area. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what it's been like for you, your experience being confined. Um, I work from home anyways. Um, I've been in wine sales for the past two and a half years. And so I'm accustomed to working from home a lot. Um, but business has really dried up because the bulk of my customers are restaurants. Um, so it's been really difficult um, not working, essentially, and also seeing all my friends also not working. Um, so this has really hit the hospitality industry really hard. Um, otherwise, we're cooking, we're cleaning closets, um, we are binge watching. Um, you know, my husband's still working, he manages station, so they're doing takeout. And um, so he's kind of staying busy and... And uh, my son's getting back to Zoom school. So 
Um, we're kind of going back to um, having a regular schedule again. At first, it was like weekends every night, right? Stay up late, right. drink a ton of wine. Um, but we're starting to get back to a more normal schedule. Got it. It's yeah, I, I resonate with everything that you're saying there. I, I am complete agreement. So tell us a little bit about what is a sommelier? So a sommelier was, it was, it used to be like in the very beginning in France, it was the person that carried all the foods and took care of the domestic animals. And so it has evolved to be um, the, the person in charge of wine, essentially. Um, and so it, it, once I'm certified through the Court of Master Sommeliers, I passed the second level um, and I decided not to go further since I'd rather work than study. Um, but I'm so proud. There are many San Diegans. Uh, several of my friends passed advanced last year, um, a couple of past masters this year. And so San Diego as a community is um, really starting to establish themselves as a great wine town. Um, but essentially a sommelier is, um, we know about wine and we can help people pick wine, right? And so when, early in my career, someone told me the joke, how do you tell the sommelier in the bar? You don't, he'll tell you. And so there's That's a lot great. of people that are, the old school sommelier is like the stuffy old guy that makes you feel bad for not knowing things. But the new wave of people like me and my friends are, we just love wine and we want to share the, you know, what we know and we want to help you enjoy the things that you like, um, but be cool about it and not be like the stuffy jerk that makes you feel bad. Um, the most important thing is to know what you like. And if you can That's tell awesome. people, you can tell, a, a, and it's not just a sommelier either, in really great retail stores, um, many of them have sommelier certifications as well and are very educated. And if you can just talk about what you like, we'll be able to find you what you need. Okay, well, you're my kind of girl then. I'm gonna give you the stage here so that you can share with us some of the knowledge. And I know that um, going through those tests that you've had to go are no joke. I mean, I've heard from other people that this is uh, some very rigorous um, studying and you really got to know your stuff to, to pass these exams. Yes, it's incredibly difficult. Like I said earlier, I did certified, but I did certified in 2007. And that was before the Saw movies where now everyone wants to be a sommelier. So the organization, I went through the Court of Master Sommeliers. There are others um, that are equally as hard and equally as valuable. It just depends on where your interests lie. Um, it requires an intense amount of study and focus and with blind tasting, it, it, you need a big budget for blind tasting and you need to have a group. Um, but the cool thing about the group part is that, you know, it's your community and we're all in this together, right? Um, and so, um, it does take a lot of study, um, but I think it's passion guided, right? And I think this is where it correlates to art is that once I got interested in wine, I wasn't really interested in anything, anything else. And so I've just kind of followed my passions and followed my palate and, you know, and discovering, you know, the wines of Spain and the wines of Portugal. There are so many interesting things out there. And it's not just, you know, a delicious alcoholic beverage. It is geology and geography. It's culture and language and people and farming and cuisine. So, um, I have, you know, that I, sounds like a rough job. Somebody's got to do it, though. <laughs> it's it's so hard. It's not. It's a little hard. But <laughs> well, let me minimize my screen so that the folks can really see you. And um, let's hear what you you want to teach us today. We're all ears and ready for it. Okay. Well, today, um, like I said earlier, there is a really wide world of wine. Uh, but the most exciting that I've discovered in the past couple of years is right in our own backyard. San Diego County is home, as of 2019, of 142 active or planned wineries. Um, San Diego was one of the very first um, wine areas cultivated in California, because if you think about um, the Jesuits and the monks, they came up north through Mexico. And so San Diego was their first stop. 
we were the first ones that were planted. Um, so my friend Eric, who owns uh, Charlie and Echo, likes to say that we're the newest, oldest wine country in California. Um, but so we had a long history of grape cultivation. But um, after uh, Prohibition and Phylloxera wiped everything out, San Diego replanted to citrus and avocado. And so that's why, um, you know, uh, like Napa and Sonoma are more well known, even though they're newer, because they sustain their focus on grape growing. So really in the past 20 years is San Diego really emerging as a fine wine area. And there's still a lot of challenges. There's still a perception that wine in San Diego isn't good. Um, and, you know, certainly there's always the, the range of, you know, wine quality. Um, but we're learning. And that's what's exciting about it is because um, we don't know what's going to be great here. And so, for example, I have this Vesper wine from Rancho Wajito Vineyard. Rancho Wajito is the last intact Mexican land grant. There are over 40 acres of vineyards planted there. Um, but they didn't plant it until 2010. So there are a good 13 or 14 different varieties they've planted there. We don't know what's going to be great. So they just have to keep planting and tending them. And uh, we'll see, right? So we just have to keep drinking and supporting local wineries, which is really important because the vast majority of San Diego wineries are owned by our family owned. And they're very small. Um, they so range wonderful. from... Um, like Vespers up in Escondido, um, their sister, like sister winery, Stelione, um, the couple that owns it, Al and Lisa Staley, they manage all the vineyards that go into Stelione wines and their daughter Alicia makes the wines. And then her and her husband have been making Vesper for almost 12 years. Um, so we're here where you might not see us a lot, but seek us out because there's some really exciting, fun things being made. Um, well, and there are you, more ways. How do you judge a, a good wine? Like, what are some of the rules of thumb, you know, as an expert that when we're opening a bottle of wine, um, what, what would you give us as some guidelines? Well, the first thing is, like I said, like without having in-depth knowledge of, you know, the difference between what flaws are like high levels of cork taint where it smells like musty basement or, um, you know, there are a bunch of different wine faults that would make a wine um, lower quality. Uh, but again, the most important thing is, do you like it? Does it taste good? Is it well made? And I think that the most important measure is, is the wine balanced? So if you take a sip of it, is there anything sticking out, right? Or does it seem like like a, just a really homogenous, like, deliciousness? So if something is, like, if you notice something right off the bat, like, oh, my gosh, that's so boozy. Like, it's too high alcohol and the alcohol sticking out. If um, it's unbalanced high acid, it'll just be making your mouth water and there's no, like, fruit to balance it out. So I think balance is the most important thing to consider. Okay. Another thing I would encourage you to look at is, of course, you know, it's my business to sell small family wineries. Um, but find out, be curious about the farming practices. You know, are they farming uh, with tons of chemicals in the vineyard? Or are they small families that are farming sustainably and using all the very best practices um, that both grow quality grapes and uh, tend the environment in a really responsible manner. And how do you so, find that out? Is there, you just go to their website or, you know, do they have to disclose it on the label? Well, that's the problem. No, no. Um, I think a lot of the people that do, um, you know, farm sustainably, organically, um, do, you know, put it in their marketing material on their websites, um, sometimes on the label on Vesper. Um, a lot of information about the winemaking is on the back of the label. Um, but it's getting to know the winery, right? So that's why I encourage you to go out and find your local, your favorite local winery in San Diego and cultivate a relationship with the family that's making the wine so that you can 
ask them. You can talk to them about their farming practices and their seller practices. And, you know, are you adding stuff? You know, how, how, how are you tending your vineyards? Um, most of the time it will, like I said, it'll be on their website. Um, but ask your, you know, your local wine shop or, you know, if, when, when we're ready to go back to restaurants, um, the person that made the wine list will probably know. And it, it like birds of a feather flock together, right? So if there is, um, when I was a sommelier and I was writing wine lists, I chose small family wineries that farm sustainably, um, like the rose now, like everything is native yeast fermentation, at least organically farmed. So when a buyer has um, like their own palate mm -hmm. and you find places that choose wines that you like, then that's a really good way to find, you know, make new discoveries. Got it. Well, let me ask you this. Is there really a big difference between a $10 bottle of wine and your $100 bottles of wine as far as, you know, is there a different process? Because I think a lot of times, you know, if you're not, if you if you don't know wine really well, and I'm kind of a novice, you know, you, you taste it, you kind of think, well, I guess it tastes a little bit better, but it, it's really hard to judge that. How do you determine that that divide in price range? Mm, like, does it, so what you're asking me is, does quality correspond to price? Yes. Um, it depends on the winemaker, right? I mean, there are large California wineries that establish reputations with really great quality, but their commercial success has pushed their quality levels down, right? And so there are definitely $10 wines that are worth every penny and more. And there are definitely expensive wines that are barely worth $10. A lot of it's marketing. <laughs> But well, we off. need your help with that. <laughs> <laughs> you got my number? Call me anytime. I got a lot of time. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's why an expert like yourself. So when you, um, when you're uh, purveying the wines from these family-owned vineyards, are you also taking those wines and making them available to folks based on your own expertise of trying them and saying, okay, this I can really get behind? And this one, eh, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah. I am starting my own business, um, which will be the very first distributor of San Diego County wines. And um, so far, I have Staleone and Vesper and Charlie and Echo. Um, and so I will definitely, it's important to sell wines that I love. Um, and so through my company, I will be doing that. Um, but again, like if you have like, a lot of people really love giant, oaky, bold reds, right? That's not my jam, but I know that other people do love it. And so I'm happy to, you know, send you in the right direction. Um, you know, and like everyone's taste is different. That's the thing to remember. Like I'm, you know, there's no like judgment on what you like because you like what you like, right? But, and again, every winemaker has their own style, so. That's it just great, means. great information. Um, you know, that's very, it's, you know, I see a lot of um, parallels between wine and art because it's kind of the same thing. I mean, I'm a professional art dealer, so I have a certain eye for art, but that doesn't mean everything that I bring into the gallery resonates with every person that walks in. And it's very much a personal preference. Um, so, you know, same thing, whatever floats yeah. your boat. I think that's great. It resonates with you, just like food and wine. And I think mm -hmm. that's a beautiful way of putting it. So yeah. um, how can we find you after all of the dust settles here? <laughs> there are a couple projects I'm involved in that are really exciting. The first is Campestre Mag. So um, this was our very first edition. We're working on printing our third one. You can find us at campestremag.com. Um, my friend Heidi started it with the idea of um, promoting San Diego and Baja wineries. Um, we're all uh, 
like I said, we're printing our third edition, which is the the female issue. Um, I got to interview Master Sommelier Laura Williamson, who was amazing. There's a lot of great stories. Um, we did a real, we had an actual reporter write an actual story about sexual harassment in the industry. So that is kind of our more serious piece. Um, so yeah, compastrymag.com. Um, we're going to do a uh, live Zoom on uh, Earth Day featuring our friends at Los Polares, um, who are a local natural winery. So we're going to do a chat with Kylie and Michael, who are co-owners of that. And um, we'll have fun release parties and things, so that's a great way. Um, I'm also part of Nat Diego, which is San Diego's fun-loving wine festival, nat featuring all natural wines. Um, last year was our fourth year, and we are so lucky and so excited that we made um, USA Today's 10 best. We're number six Yay. in the country. So really, it is, it's a celebration of natural wine and natural wine producers, and, um, and really, it's an excuse for us all to get together and drink good wine and have a good time. So unfortunately, we postponed this year. Um, so we may do something towards the end of the year. We're really not sure yet. So um, those are okay. two of the best ways to um, find me and drink wine. I also um, am at CNSV Tasting Room, which is a tasting room for Staleone and Vesper. It's up in Escondido. Um, you can find them at cnsv.com. You can buy the wines through there. And when the dust settles and we all go back to life, the tasting room's open on weekends. Okay, it's going to be packed. I'm sure we're all ready to get out of here and go go do some tasting, for sure. Exactly. Well, thank you so Absolutely. much for being on the show. We have um, Tammy's website on our little ticker here, and so you know you guys can go there, connect with her. It's always nice to have an expert tasting your wine before you buy three or four cases. I I highly recommend it. I'm going to definitely uh, be using her on this. Let me just see if I can bring myself up. Yeah. Text there me. We are. You can reach me on Instagram, Wine and Tammy Time. So I'm happy to answer questions and help however I can. Okay. Thanks so much, Tammy. Enjoy this Thank beautiful you, day and be safe to it your family. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, folks, that was Tammy Wong and she is an amazing woman very much about bringing wine into our lives. And, you know, these um, uh, sommeliers that come on the scene, I mean, that is a very rigorous, that's a very serious training. And I have a, a, another friend who does that. So, you know, when we can get like a tip from them, it's almost like a stockbroker saying, try this one. And if you can get them, especially if they're locally sourced or they're relatively new to the market, you can get some really great values on wines that you'll see those wines continue to kind of creep up over time. But we're going to try to get Gabe Leonard. You know, the problem is, is I don't see Gabe on my screen. So I might have to grab my phone here and call him. Um, let me just see what I did with my phone because I know he was having some technical difficulties earlier. So let me see. I'm going to call Gabe. And we're going to see if we can't get Gabe on the phone at least and then have him try one more time. Let's see if we can get a hold of Gabe Leonard. Hey there. Okay, but you're not in the stream. So do you want to try to click out and then try to rejoin? Okay, give it a shot. And I'll share with these beautiful folks that are watching us on the phone right now a little bit about you and give you a minute to come on, okay? Okay. Okay, Gabe, he's such a cool guy. And we've represented, some of you folks have been to our Gabe Leonard shows in the past. He's known as a cinematic um, artist. And the reason for that is because a lot of his work is definitely, and I see him in the stream. Can you hear me, Gabe? I can hear you. It's a beautiful day. Let me bring him on up before I lose him again. There you are, Gabe Leonard, folks. Hello. Say hi to everybody there, Gabe. You're live. Hi. Should I have my camera vertical or horizontal? Does it matter? It works really great like that, however you had it. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, that's good. <laughs> 
So I was just sharing a little bit, Gabe, about your background, that you have been very much influenced by the cinema. I know that we had some amazing shows with you that had more of a Western um, approach, you know, pulling mm -hmm. from that. Can you share a little bit about your inspiration? Well, the inspiration behind the paintings come from a lot of places. Uh, the, the influences from cinema, I think, are just as a matter of growing up watching TV and movies, uh, I've done a few pieces that have specific references to movies, but most of them are sort of a cinematic vibe to them because I, I tend to paint people that are in action. Uh, like you mentioned, I, I do a lot of uh, Western-themed paintings. A lot of that has to do with uh, growing up in Wyoming and being from a cowboy state. So I really connect with the with the personality types in that in that genre. Um, but like I like I was mentioning, the the goal of the paintings is to do paintings that have people in action and in motion and they're doing something, rather than just posing for a painting. So there's a story implied or or an explicit story that it, that is uh, shown in the each image. And a lot of times they're individual characters uh, with an abstract abstract background which allows, I think, uh, viewers to use their imagination to connect dots and leap to their own conclusions about what's going on. Yeah, I think that the thing that really, um, you know, captures people when they view your work for the first time is that you've got a lot of action, but you've got these exaggerated hands and these, you know, the rifles and um, it's bigger than life. It's like how you feel when you go to a blockbuster movie, you know, everything yeah. is coming at you and you do such a great job of capturing that feeling. Yeah. There's a lot of distortions and figures and objects and paintings. A lot, a lot of that is cause it's fun to do it that way. And, and making things look larger than life and entertaining is interesting to me. So that that's something that shows through in the work. I think the big hands are more of a, character design element i think where you know you maybe a picture strong rough and tough people having big hammer fists <laughs> uh, right. the female characters that i make paintings of are also really strong and self self uh realized uh their hands aren't always gigantic the, you know the female hands are slender have pointy fingertips they're more sensuous that sort of thing it's but, very uh, everybody, it's very recognizable kind of, what's that very recognizable. So if you see a Gabe Leonard, you'll know it, you know, from, you know, 50, 50 distance away, you'll say, oh, I know who that artist is because you've really, you know, brought something that nobody else is doing for sure. So what are you working on now? Well, I've got a portrait of Frederick Douglass right here that I'm working on. Okay. So and let me see if I can, I'll switch, I'm going to switch the camera around so you can okay. see what I'm doing here. And I'll minimize my camera so we can, we can get a better look. So this is what I'm working on right now. This is kind of a, uh, hearkening back to how I got started with my outlaw stuff. I started doing a lot of historical references. I've read the, the autobiography of Frederick Douglass years ago. Then I reread it again about a year ago and I've always wanted to do a painting of him. Never quite got around. Then I was thinking about it last week and it just kind of popped in my head about how I wanted to approach it. So this is, I don't know, maybe three or four hours into the painting right here. Oh, that's and, amazing. And I work on and I have uh, my paints and my brushes, all that kind of stuff set up. And then I have more palettes for every painting that I work on. And then I have my acrylic station where I do my, my uh, limited edition embellishments. Oh, so can we really, see that one up close? That's that's great. Yeah, this is Jimi Hendrix, so you can see the uh, maybe see the brush strokes that I put on some of these. You can see I can get the right angle on it. And is that part of your uh, musician series then? Yeah, this is a Jimi Hendrix painting. Obviously, I, this is one of the older ones. I did this like in two thousand seven or eight, I think, the original. Right. So and then I add the uh, you know he's different embellishment gels, different things. And the artist proofs I actually paint with uh, with acrylics. This is what I have set up right here for. That's so, nice. So how's this, uh, how's this um, corona epidemic affected you and your ability to work? What, has it been positive, negative, in between? Uh, well, I do this all day from home anyways. So as far as the stay at home, it's pretty much not changed my life too much. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't get to go out and exercise like I normally did. I used, you know, I trained Brazilian Jiu Jitsu two or three times a week. So I haven't been able to do that for a while, which I miss. 
for some other paintings I've been working on. Yeah, I'd love to see if you can, yeah, maybe turn that because we only have one piece left in our gallery. We're going to have to restock soon, but take sure. a look at some of these folks. There's another one I was I did during the, during the Rona break. <laughs> and this one I'm working on right here. That is so cool. And here's a few more just on the walls of my studio. So you have, what you're showing on your walls of your studio, you've had these series. And I remember you had one yeah. that was the Lux series, right? Is that what we're seeing? Yeah, so I've, I've just come out with uh, five books. So I'll show you those real quick. And they are broken down by series as well. And let's see, so I'll go over to my table over here where you see what we're doing. So I have this uh, so optional hard case. They're 12 by 12 inch hard hardcover books. So this is an artist proof that I've varnished. It's going to be shipping out here shortly. So let me get the books out. I'm trying to hold this while holding my phone at the same time. It's kind of tricky. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Give me a second here. So I have uh, five books. This being the first book of the series, which I did a Kickstarter last year to raise the funds to publish produce all these books. They're all printed in, uh, through a printer in Long Beach. So they're all made and manufactured in the U.S., both printed and bound. So I have that, which is about, a, which is how many pages? It's like 80 pages. And this chronicles work from about 2007 from the start of my outlaws through about 2012. Oh, my god! And gosh. I have the second book, of Power, Love, and Success, which is like business guys and everything. So they're go through these like they're I've if you uh, follow me on Facebook or anything you, you know that I post a lot of uh, one-liner quotes all the time so I've incorporated some of those into my book kind of humorous yes but uh just give you an idea what these look like so is that book then I did uh, the, like what well, you have the luck book but I actually expanded that book and added a lot more to it a lot of other pieces that were completed after the after uh, the main thrust of the collection was put out into into a book. Wait, go back. Was that a self-portrait? Uh, I don't think I have a self-portrait. I have a portrait I did of a friend of mine who kind of looks like me at the time. Okay, that's not you then. So, but yeah, we used to be like stunt doubles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then I, then I did the Desperado series. So I have a book for the Desperados. So these are available as individual books as well as as a as a collection and with an optional hard case slip cover, which I actually I I do a drawing on top of with a silver sharpie, and they're limited to what one hundred on the on the hard cases. So if you wanted to get something that's you know kind of collectible, Those there's are a series of uh, you know a, a lot of big images, double page spreads. You know if you're if you're really into what I'm doing and, and you know, you might have a couple of pieces. Getting a book is a good way to you know, pass the time. Way. I mean, it's not gonna, they're not long reads. but. <laughs> well, what's nice is you get to see the entirety of the collections as you, you know, you when you conceptualize things, I know you've been really very focused on certain ideas. And then yeah. seeing those come to fruition through, you know, the whole collection in a book, that what a great idea. How, yeah. how long how long of a project was that? Because I know books are hard to put together. Um, well, I had started the designs on the book about a – say I, start, I started a Kickstarter in April of last year, right around, right around this time. And I'd already had the designs kind of pre – pre, you know, like been working on them with a designer that I work with. Okay. And uh, that started in the, the December or so before. So I had probably about a year and a half of working on the books, be, between working on the books – getting the fun, the Kickstarter going and completed and then getting the publisher lock, uh, locked in and getting all the proofs done and finalizing the designs and then printing. And then fulfillment took about a year and a half to do all five books. I think. Oh, my goodness. So that's a huge art project in itself. Yeah, it took, uh, it was actually, it was more stressful than this coronavirus lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> My shoulders oh, I, were nuts. I was like just super stressed out. It was such a roller coaster ride. And and so far this has been 
more inconvenience than anything, which I'm, I guess I'm thankful for because it, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we got some, we got food and water and all kinds of things. We're, you know, we're, we're okay. So I know there's lots of people that are suffering a lot more hardships. So, you know, my heart kind of goes out for those people and, and, uh, yeah. try to encourage anybody who's struggling right now to hang on and we're doing the right thing, I think. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> between working on paintings and organizing and rearranging the furniture in my studio and arguing with conspiracy theorists online, I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> you are, is, are you going to have your next series? Is it going to be coronavirus conspiracy? Well, I, I, ha I have a series uh, that I did called Rust, Dust, and Lust, which I have a 20-page booklet out for. And I sent you some of the newer images, like the, the new train painting and uh, one called Goliath, one called The Shady Here. And, and uh, I did those series uh, about a, in 2018. And um, the, the thing is, is it, I was doing, I was, I was doing references. I, going up, I was going up to Reno for some reason to do some references for people that I, I had a friend that had a friend who had a horse ranch up there. So we went up there to shoot references for horses and, and, and girls and stuff and the guns on horses and traveling back and forth uh, in the valley behind the Sierra Mountain. Sierra Mountains, uh, a lot of the smoke from the fires that were going on in, like the, in, the, um, in the Yosemite area were coming over the mountains and it's creating this really yellow, hazy atmosphere and it looked really post-apocalyptic. So a lot of the color palettes I chose for that, those paintings were in, in that, that uh, sort of uh, color theme. And they seem to kind of relate to the so, social dynamics going on now with everybody wearing masks and this sort of, uh, you know, sense of like n uncertainty going on, you know, so I, I wouldn't necessarily call this an apocalypse, uh, you know, in this, in a, you know, in a general sense, you know, it's like, I guess when you think of that, you think of like some sort of nuclear blast or some sort of war where we don't have anything that really looks different other than less traffic, but, but uh, mm -hmm. there's a certain um, em emotional, thing everybody's going through and we're all going through this together and and uh it's something that nobody that we no we've never done this before we've never been through this and it's it's to me very curious about how people are handling it and it's it's difficult it's difficult to be isolated i mean i'm kind of used to it being in my studio a lot but i realize a lot of people aren't used to having to be by themselves or, or quarantined at home uh, even if they're not by themselves, it can be, you can get, you get sick of yourself after a while. You, you can. And right. uh, so, you know, I guess I, you know, one of the things I've been doing a lot is reaching out to friends and family and doing video chats such as this. Uh, that seems to help. I think it's a good time for us to, you know, to re reach out and connect to our friends that we might otherwise not spend a lot of time trying to talk to, you know, we just kind of see them casually online, but, don't really spend time reconnecting with people. So it's been good for that. I think, you know, I've been connected with my family a lot more than I normally am. You know, normally you just call once in a while, you chit chat with them or send a message, but they're making it a point to call people that uh, are important to me and, and uh, just checking in with them, see how people are doing. Yeah. That's a really good word. I would say that one of the things that, you know, when we, I was getting ready to have you on the show, just looking through your works and that is, I was just thinking that, you know, a lot of your work is so empowering. You know, I mean, it, it shows the strength of the human character. You've got all these characters that a lot of them are either in these high powered positions where they have a lot of responsibility or you, you know, the modern ones. And then you go back to the Western where you're showing people that, you know, they were in the old timey days where they had to be able to be self-reliant and, you know, carry their pistols and, and be strong individuals. And I thought, you know, when you have a piece of art like that in your home, it affects how you feel about even a situation like this, you can almost glean some inner strength from your work. And I, um, you know, I love the piece I have for that reason, you know, and I love the way that you paint women because they're so empowered. But um, I think that this in this time, Gabe, your work is really resonating in a very powerful way with folks. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. It's I think this is 
from an artist perspective, I think this is a great opportunity for artists to step up and, and reach out and be a part of, be part of people's lives. There's, I mean, there's not as much to, else to pay attention to. There's not live game like sports going on. There's not a lot of new television to watch. It's it's a chance for artists to reach out and connect and, and uh, I think support our community emotionally. You know, like uh, this is <laughs> this is funny. Is like the uncertainty that people feel is like I've my whole career has been that uh, been you know I've bankrupted myself several times trying to make things work as an artist you know and then somehow dug myself out of holes and and been in situations where i didn't know where the money's coming from for quite a while it's like i've been through this a bunch of times not quite like this where everybody's in a situation but uh but uh, it's it's something that you know like i feel like i actually i was more stressed out a few months ago than i am now it's like even though there's more uncertainty overall, I feel mm -hmm. comforted somehow knowing that everybody is in this together and, and uh, you know, you're not, you're not stuck out there by yourself out on a limb, you know, this, we're all, we're all going through this and, and uh, you know, if we can reach out and, you know, you know, in which way we can, I know we can't like, reach out and hug each other so much anymore, which is difficult, but like I said, reaching out and connecting in whatever way we can, I think it's important to, keep our sanity is to yeah, stay connected and know that we support each other. So do you, did you, do you have any, um, you know, plans for a new series of work? Are you working on anything that we can look forward to down the road? I've, I've started, uh, uh, some series that have to do with cars, like, um, think Mopar and old Cadillacs. And, you know, I did a painting recently. I kind of started from looking at old classic movies. And I, I did one of the first ones I did, was a painting of, from a, a scene from the movie Bullet, which was uh, like a 1960 Steve McQueen movie. And there's a chase scene in, in San Francisco where they're, you know, a Mustang's chasing a, I think it was a Challenger. And they're, and they're going over the hills around Sa San Francisco, like by Union Street or Fillmore, Fillmore Street or something. And uh, and it was just a crazy scene. And so I did that painting, which was really fun. Then I did a, a painting of uh, the Chevy Nova from, from Death Proof, which was a Quentin Tarantino movie. And, with uh, with uh, uh, what was it, Kurt Russell, mm -hmm. and Kurt Russell's character was a guy named Stuntman Mike, who I thought was really cool, and I'd like to make a character that's similar to that guy. I got a project that I uh, I'm working on. Uh, it's a script called The Bitter End, and it's going to be more. And this is something I've been toying with before all this happened, and it's sort of a post-apocalyptic what rockabilly western, where everybody there's been some sort of disease or blight that's went through, and everybody that's still alive is either crazy or left-handed. That's, that's who hasn't been affected by this disease. And, uh, it takes place like in the desert around, around between Reno and Salt Lake city and Las Vegas. And, and, uh, it's kind of like Mad Max meets, uh, uh, I don't know, like, like, uh, the book of Eli or something. <laughs> Sounds great. But it'd be like these characters, that, like big pompadous and like bikers and people, you know, you know, put together old cars and stuff. And uh, the main character is a character who uh, starts out okay, but he's on his medications and he runs out of medications. And so he splits into three personalities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's pretty true. It might turn it into more of a graphic novel than maybe short film. Maybe That's feature how film I've been feeling lately. <laughs> What's that? I've been feeling like I'm split personality going through all of that. <laughs> well, they just come into focus. <laughs> That's it. You got it, right? You got it. Well, thank you, Gabe, for being yep. on the show. We can't wait to have you here again, you know, time permitting yep. the gallery. And, folks, you can go on to uh, Gabe's website. You can also go on to our, our website, EC Gallery. We've posted some of the most recent works, including the books. So you can order um, if you'd like to. And... Let's just continue to support the arts. Gabe, you've been such an important part of the art community and I can't thank you enough for what you've brought to the table. And also, like you were mentioning, let me bring myself up here. There we go. Like you were mentioning, um, your story, which we didn't really get into. I mean, you really started from really like, you know, the very, very bottom of just casting everything but art all caution to the wind and focusing 100% on your art, which I know was 
I mean, that's a very tough thing to do and struggled for a long yeah, time before well, you this there's no backup plan. plans. <laughs> uh, and you know what? We are all benefit. We all benefit from your great talent. So thank you again. And um, I appreciate that. Can't wait to see more of your work. You can so, see more of it well, on my website, GabeLeonard.com. All my social media is g at GabeLeonardArt. That's uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. I don't do much on Twitter, but I'm, I post quite a bit on Instagram and Facebook, so you can follow me there. Perfect. And uh, that's, that, yeah, that's pretty much the most of it. Got a YouTube okay. channel. You can look me up on YouTube. I'm uh, putting time lapses together quite often. So if you want to see how I work, you can watch my time lapses on both YouTube and my Facebook and Instagram pages. Uh, yeah. And the quality is much better because I know we were having that discussion. This guy's pretty high tech. So we've got a lot to learn from him on what type of cameras to get. So we yeah, can I mean, I, I haven't used this app before, but I have a whole setup to do, to do really high resolution live streaming through uh, an, a different OBS software for, I started out with on Twitch and that works for Facebook as well. I wasn't quite sure if I could set it up here as easily. I think the phone kind of works for, for what we're doing now, but uh, if we do it again, I can maybe look into setting it up a little, a little more great. elaborate, maybe do a painting demo or something, you know, we can do something like that too. Okay. Well, for the layman here, I got to have click and, and point and you can see even where that's gotten us. But um, yeah, well, yeah, well, you, it looks like you're doing a good job. So <laughs> we're, do, we're doing what we can, you know, so it'll get it'll improve. But thanks again so much yep. Gabe, for being on the show. You're no you are a huge blessing to all of us who own your work and then just to the art world in general. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Ruth Anna. That means a lot. I appreciate it. That, okay. Thank you for the work that you're doing out there too, and the show, and 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 uh, yeah, it's 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 really good to have things to connect to. So I'm glad you're doing it. Agreed. All right, be blessed, my friend. I'll talk to All you right. again. Be safe. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye. All right. What a great artist, folks. For those of you who don't know who Gabe Leonard is, I highly recommend you research him. Go on to EC Gallery as well. We have the newest works, and then you can go on to Gabe's website and see everything that he's created. He's really a brilliant artist. Uh, one of his big collectors is Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. You know, of course, when you see the work, you'll see why. But we are so excited. We've got a, another day here in the week that we're bringing uh, live streaming to you, Art of the City TV. And on Friday, we've dedicated that to the kids. So if you've got kiddos out there, uh, children, grandchildren that are interested in art, we've got the kids coming on to teach your kids how to paint. So Isabella, my daughter of Bella Hart, she's gonna be doing a painting demo. She also got this crazy idea that not all of you might have paint at home. So she's gonna teach a little class of how to make homemade tempera paint. And tempera is something that was used um, you know, in some of the old um, churches in Europe in the 1600s. And all you need is egg yolks and color dye and some brushes. And then she suggested that if you don't have canvas or something to paint on, just get a paper plate. So she's gonna show the kids how to do that. Then we're gonna go into Michael Floor's household and his kids are artists, specifically his middle child, Everett, who is quite a, you know, for a little guy, he's quite an accomplished sculptor. So he's going to give a little sculpting class. Prior to the kids coming on, we have a, a very um, wonderful child advocate artist, Sandy Cottrell. She's also the promoter of Art Walk San Diego. There's, I think, four or five now. And she has been an advocate for the arts here in San Diego, probably one of the most important folks here in the arts in San Diego. So she's going to come on, share a little bit about what she does with artists and then uh, share with us one of her uh, passions, which is a program called Art Reach for Kids. So don't miss it, 1 p.m. on Friday, and share it with your friends, Art of the City TV streaming here on Facebook. Be well, let's all keep our heads about us. We're gonna get through this. Um, you know, we, we've got a finish line we're looking at probably about a month, hopefully sooner. But um, I really look forward to seeing all of your comments here on this live feed, and I'll look forward to seeing you Friday. Be blessed, folks, and have a great, until I see you Friday, have a great couple days here.